Hey, ever heard of a fire rainbow? Yeah, me neither. How about a circumhorizontal arc? Didn't think so, but just so you know, they're one and the same thing. At first glance, it looks like a painting, or like a rainbow-colored splash in the sky. Despite the name, they have nothing in common with either fire or rain. This phenomenon happens on rare occasions when the sun shines through a particular type of ice cloud formation. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, a specific type of ice crystals and clouds needs to be present for the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that moon halos are usually white, and sun halos can be rainbow-colored. When visiting regions with high altitudes, you may be one of the lucky people to stumble upon penitentes. They're basically naturally formed ice spikes. For them to be formed, they need a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor rather than melting it into water. And that's why these blades of snow and ice start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. As cute as they may be, they can end up as tall as 15 feet. Now, what happens when small individual droplets of lava meet the wind? Pele's hair, basically. Let me explain. The word Pele comes from an ancient Hawaiian symbol for volcanoes. Whenever the wind picks up little drops of lava, it stretches them into hair-like strands, similar to the process of glass wire creation. These delicate strands can stretch as far as 6 feet. On rare occasions, it can rain without any clouds. But does it really? Let's look at the science behind this rare phenomenon. It's sometimes called a sun shower, just because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. Let's be clear though, there is no way rain can ever come down directly from a star. Rain clouds are at a bit of a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Add a little wind to blow the rain in your direction, and ta-da! You get sun showers. Located in Bolivia is a place called Salar de Uni. It's the largest salt flat in the world. It's also the home of half of the world's lithium, which is a crucial component for making batteries. But what else is so special about this place? Well, whenever the rain season comes, it turns this piece of flat land into a perfectly reflective mirror lake. What comes to your mind when you hear about the Blood Falls? A horror movie? (laughs) Well, they are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special kind of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets the air. Hence, the reddish color of the waterfall, which also gives it its trademark name. Okay, we all know the song, but it's not really made up. There is actually such a thing called a desert rose. It's not a plant, though, but a unique form of the mineral gypsum. It develops in dry sandy places that can occasionally flood. This constant switching between a wet and dry environment lets the gypsum crystals emerge between grains of sand, trapping them and forming a rose-like shape. Ever heard of the Eye of Sahara? Scientists are still trying to figure out how it was formed. You can only see it if you fly above it, but it's basically a naturally formed dome that dates back to approximately 100 million years ago. And no, I wasn't around then. It has a rough diameter of 25 miles and consists of a bunch of concentric rings. The biggest one, or the central area, measures about 19 miles in diameter. Astronauts were some of the first people to notice it, and it's been studied ever since. In fact, even to this day, when landing in Florida, they know they're almost home when they see the Eye of Sahara. One of the most beautifully colored trees in the world is located in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's called the rainbow eucalyptus. It got its name because of its bark that switches colors and peels away as the tree ages. The bright green bark is the youngest, as it contains a substance called chlorophyll, usually found in leaves. It then switches to purple and then to the color red. And finally, it turns brown as it grows and loses the chlorophyll. 
Now, don't be tricked into thinking that's a whole forest. It's one single tree. And no, it's not some sort of optical illusion either. Let me explain. Underneath that soil, there is a complex network of roots that connects around 47,000 tree-like shapes you see above the ground. It's called the quaking aspen. Some of these trees are among the oldest and largest organisms in the world. Now, here's a good destination for all travelers, or maybe not so good after all. The most lightning-stricken area in the world, according to recent data released by NASA, is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Out of all the days in a year, 300 of them feature thunderstorms in this location. What makes this area so unique, though, that storms happen so often? Well, it's because where cool mountain air meets the warm, moist breeze and generates electricity over the lake. The Eternal Flame Falls are located in upstate New York, near the Canadian border. In this region, there is a tiny waterfall with a big secret, a spark about 8 inches tall. Turns out there's a natural gas seat that provides fuel to the flame behind the waterfall. The waterfall provides enough coverage so that it stays lit pretty much every time. Hikers do enjoy to relight it if they see that it's been blown out. This phenomenon is actually quite common, but this one gained more popularity because it is younger than most. And it looks very good in pictures, let's be honest. I've heard of yellow sand, white sand, and even black sand here or there. But I've never heard of green beaches until now. Papacolia also known as Green Sand Beach, is located in Hawaii and is one of the few beaches in the world that features green sand. The unique coloring comes from olivine rock that was formed when a nearby volcano erupted. Actually, in Hawaii, all the volcanoes are nearby. Move over green sands because some of the other beaches around the world can even glow at night. And it's completely natural. The culprit? A little thing called photoplankton or microalgae, as they're sometimes called. They're basically little plants that contain chlorophyll and need sunlight in order to live and grow. Most photoplankton kinds are able to float in the upper part of the ocean, where the sunlight can still reach them beneath the water. When the photoplankton gets agitated by the movement of waves and currents, they emit light, which looks like some glow during the night. These special microorganisms are found on beaches in a lot of places around the world, such as the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and the Everglades. At the base of a mountain located just outside of Afton, Wyoming, is a little river called the Intermittent Spring. There are only three of this kind in the whole world, but what makes this little string of water so mysterious? Well, the fact that it starts and stops every few minutes scientists have yet to pinpoint precisely why this happens. They speculate that it's basically just a siphon effect that happens deep within the ground that causes the river to just start and stop so often. Should you ever be interested in checking it out, be sure to do so in the late summer, as that's when the intermittent spring is most active. Do you see the irony here? You can only see the spring in the summer? Okay, I'm done. Rocks rolling down the slopes of a rumbling volcano, pushing other bigger rocks on their way, and eventually tumbling down into the ocean in a humongous cascade, causing a wave the height of which the world's never seen before. This is what might happen if the Helena slump of the Hawaiian Big Island falls off into the water. The Kilauea volcano is far from dormant. The latest eruption occurred in 2018. Its eruptions are usually accompanied by earthquakes of different magnitudes. And with each quake, the magma rocks on the slopes of the volcano shift down. These rock formations are called slumps, and the Helena slump is the most notorious of them all. In 1868, the shift of this slump caused a tidal wave rising as tall as 60 feet. But what's most troubling is that some 110,000 years ago, a landslide here led to one of the most powerful earthquakes ever, which in turn led to a mega tsunami of over a thousand feet in height. Scientists are worried that such an event may repeat in the future. If that happens, the wave might engulf the whole of Hawaii and easily reach both North and South American coasts. Geologists are quick to reassure, though, that a landslide like this is unlikely to occur anytime soon. It's just too early for that. 
But when it finally does, the consequences will be catastrophic. Have a nice day! Yellowstone National Park in the western USA is world-famous for its dazzling views, and especially the colorful Grand Prismatic Spring at its very heart. But we should all stay aware that Yellowstone is, first and foremost, an enormous caldera, basically a slumbering supervolcano. The difference between a regular volcano, like Kilauea from earlier, and a supervolcano is that the latter is thousands of times more powerful. Imagine an eruption spewing tons of huge rock and rivers of hot lava, pumping out clouds of ash that make countries stop air travel for weeks. And now multiply all of this by a thousand. This is what a Yellowstone eruption would look like. At first, a huge area in the middle of the national park would shake, crumble, and then blast upwards in a megaton explosion. Lava flows and magma rocks would cover the area of about 40 square miles, roughly half of Washington, D.C. But the greatest danger is the volcanic ash. The ashen plume would rise miles above and get carried by the wind in every direction. Since the eruption would be far from ordinary, the spread and damage would also be much greater than usual. The ash is thick and heavy, so it would cover a vast area in a blanket, destroying crops and even buildings. Worse still, it would spread in the air and block out the sun, leading to a drastic drop in temperature and an artificial winter. Even regular volcanoes can lower temperatures worldwide by a few degrees. A supervolcano may potentially cause a new ice age. Luckily, the chances of Yellowstone supervolcano erupting in the near future, or at all, are extremely low. There have been only three of those in the history of Earth, and there's no evidence such a disaster should repeat. Scientists estimate the probability at 0.00014%, which is lower than the chances of an asteroid wiping us all out. Speaking of which… If dinosaurs could talk, and were at least still alive for that matter, they'd tell you that asteroid threat is as real as it gets. Scientists at NASA say they've tracked 90% of all near-Earth asteroids of significant size, and none of them are a matter of any concern. But there are still the other 10% in the great unknown. What's more, asteroids can change their line of flight because of the pull of other celestial bodies and eventually turn our way. Lucky us! Now, if an asteroid big enough, like a mile across, hits the Earth, it will first cause an explosion powerful enough to erase a dozen big cities in a matter of seconds. Then the impact will raise a cloud of dust and debris that will block out the sun, just like the ash cloud from a volcano, and cause a centuries-long winter on the whole planet. But even if it falls into the ocean, which is more likely, a resulting wave will rise several miles high, washing coastal cities off the face of the planet. But at least there won't be a new ice age. Although scientists are pretty sure there's no such threat in the near future, it can't be ruled out completely, and humanity needs at least five years to prepare for this event. If a big near-Earth asteroid suddenly changes its course and turns right toward our planet, we won't stand a chance against it. Disaster movie, anyone? A much more probable calamity, though, rests right beneath our feet. It's the San Andreas Fault in California. The fault has been ready for rupture for years now. And scientists estimate that an earthquake along this line is likely to occur in the next three decades. And when it happens, it won't be nice. They expect a magnitude of 8.0, which is comparable to some of the most devastating quakes in history. It's all the more dangerous since California is home to some of the most populated cities in the western US, including Los Angeles and San Francisco. High-rise buildings are common there, and they're particularly vulnerable against underground shakes. The San Andreas earthquake might cause a whole lot of damage both to cities and countryside. In the worst-case scenario, the ground might break apart, destroying buildings, farms, and changing the landscape altogether. Still, scientists believe that the probability of such a quake is only 7% for the next 30 years. So there's a rather big chance, um, 93%, that we'll never see that in our lifetime. Yet, there's another earthquake hazard not so far away from the previous one. The mega thrust in Chile. The country sits right above the subduction zone, an area where two tectonic plates meet and go one beneath the other. 
At the place of their meeting, stress has accumulated because of their continuous movement. And once that strain is too much, a major earthquake occurs. Chile has experienced a lot of quakes in the recent years, and scientists are worried those might be preparing the area for a really big one. They believe a great earthquake is due to happen before the end of the century, and it might be devastating to the coastal area. Even smaller quakes caused tsunamis that flooded the west coast, and a huge one like that is likely to raise a wave of incredible height. On the bright side, Chile now knows to prepare in advance for the coming natural disasters, and geologists are pretty sure people will be able to evacuate before the earthquake strikes. In September of 1859, astronomer Richard Carrington was looking at the sun and suddenly saw a bright flare on its surface. He made a note of it in his records, but only realized how important it was a couple of days later. The energy from that flare reached Earth and struck it directly, causing northern lights to appear above Cuba and burning telegraph lines all around the world. This was dubbed the Carrington Event, and it was a solar storm. Such storms hit the Earth fairly often, but none of them were so powerful as the Carrington Event, neither before nor after. But in 2012, astronomers registered a similar solar flare whose energy nearly hit our planet once again. If it had been just a week earlier, we'd have been in big trouble. Today, humanity relies on electricity in almost every aspect of life, and a powerful solar storm would mess with the electromagnetic field of Earth a lot. All electric appliances would either shut down or short-circuit, and huge transformers powering basically everything would go out of order for good. It would take years to repair them, and the cost of such a massive blackout would count in trillions of dollars. The worst of it is that science is almost unable to predict solar storms. And even if we could know about them in advance, we'd be powerless to stop them. The flare happens in a matter of seconds and it takes about 8 minutes for the particles to reach the Earth's atmosphere, causing the disturbance. The power outage would come a bit later, in a day or so, when a massive cloud of plasma gets to our planet. At the moment, there's no protection against solar flares, and the chances of one powerful enough to cut all of our electricity in the next few years are quite high, about 12%. The only good thing about all this is that we now know of such a possibility and can at least prepare in advance. Hey, don't forget to pack some underwear and socks. You'll always need those. You feel some rumbling from below. No, it's not your tummy. It's low and ominous. You look up and see strange lights hanging above the ground. They look like shimmering balls of light hovering high up in the sky. Your throat goes dry and you gulp. That's what they call the earthquake lights. This phenomenon is poorly understood. But witnesses say they've seen it in different shapes and sizes. It could be in the form of light balls, sheet lightning, streamers, and a steady glow in the sky. Soon after, a strong earthquake follows. Scientists can't explain why those lights appear. And they don't always do either. Some believe that's a reaction of underground gases released into the atmosphere. Sure enough, an earthquake begins. But lucky you, it's not as strong as you expected. The ground is shaking, but you even manage to keep your balance. It stops as abruptly as it began, and you walk home. On the way home, you see a flash and hear a whip crack. Lightning has struck a lone tree near where you just stood. It's caught on fire, and there's a column of flames rising to the sky. Still no rain, and the pillar becomes taller and taller. Have you heard of such a thing as a fire tornado? These phenomena occur when the wind is caught in a circle close to the ground because of the difference in air pressure. Such mini tornadoes are usually easy to notice. Small rubble, dust, sand, and leaves rise into the air and start flying in rapid circles. But then, if there's a source of fire nearby, the funnel can catch it and blow it stronger like bellows. The flames go round and round, reaching ever higher and eventually creating a swirling, blazing tower. Luckily, fire tornadoes are short-lived and don't normally cause much damage. But don't try to hide from the storm under that tree. You can find this unusual plant in Florida and in some parts of the Caribbean coast. Externally, it doesn't look special at all. A gray trunk, green leaves, and fruit similar to small apples. 
What you must remember is never to pluck these apples and never stand next to the tree, especially if it's raining. This is the manchineel tree, which is considered the most dangerous in the world. Its trunk, bark, branches, and fruit contain poisonous juice. One drop of this corrosive acidic liquid can harm your skin a lot. The tree can secrete this juice, and if you accidentally touch it, you risk burning your hand. When it rains, water droplets fall on the tree and mix with the poison. Water can also bounce off the bark and get on your skin. That's why you shouldn't stand nearby either. There are almost no other shrubs or mushrooms growing around. Animals avoid these trees, and people don't chop them and don't pluck the fruit. You can't make a bonfire from their branches. Burning wood emits poisonous smoke that can damage your eyes. Locals know this tree well, but tourists and travelers might accidentally get harmed. That's why most manchineel trees are marked with paint or have a warning sign. In western Venezuela, Locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did once stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano. The most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So it's super scary volcano clouds plus lightning. Whoa! Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. In the hottest and one of the driest places on Earth, Africa's Donakil Desert, temperatures often rise above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The out-of-this-world landscape has many active volcanoes and geysers that spit out toxic gases like chlorine and sulfur. The vibrantly green, electric blue, and yellow waters are all rain and seawater warmed up by magma. One wrong step here, and you'd be gone for good. This happened in June 2009. People in certain areas in Japan left their homes after a heavy downpour, only to find fish, frogs, and tadpoles everywhere. Fields, roads, lawns, and rooftops were littered with these aquatic creatures. One man was shocked to see 13 carp on and around his truck. Apparently, he stopped to count them. No one knows for sure where the bizarre rain came from, but the most popular theory claims that a powerful water spout picked up all these creatures. Then it carried them through the upper atmosphere and dropped the animals on the unsuspecting people below. And now, welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria that eats leaves, grass, insects, or any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid! 
Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water. I mean, acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest, and come back at night when it's cooler. In the dark, the lake seems to glow. Right above it, you see light-filled, exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. The sea turns sinister red, and no living being can survive in it. it. Must be some dark magic. In fact, it's tiny algae that spread uncontrollably, giving the water this specific tint called the red tide. They have toxins that destroy sea mammals, birds, and turtles, as well as creatures that feed on them. For humans, contact with it ends in breathing problems or seafood poisoning. Sometimes even huge ships sink in the open seas for no visible reason. That reason is often the pockets of bubbles that underwater volcanoes produce even while they're sleeping. Those productive magma factories are hidden under 8,500 feet of water. When they wake up, they act just like land volcanoes, and they can cause destructive tsunamis. This tree looks like a bottle. No wonder it's called the bottle tree. It grows in Namibia and attracts many tourists. But don't get too close to the tree because it's one of the most dangerous on Earth. Milky juice flows inside the trunk. It's highly toxic to the human body. On the bright side, though, the trees have beautiful pink-white leaves with a red core. There's a tree growing in Western Australia that was once used as a prison. A cell for criminals existed inside the Boab prison tree for a long time. People were usually kept there temporarily, just for one night. After that, they were taken to their final destination. The prison was built more than 1,500 years ago and has been perfectly preserved to this day. Tourists visiting this place can sneak a peek inside.